So we still have people joining, but uh, in the interest of respecting everyone's time, uh, for those of you who are here now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and kick us off here. So uh, uh, welcome. Um, uh, pleased to see you all here today. Uh, I think you're going to be in for a treat with the session that we have planned for you. Uh, for those of you who I don't know, I am Melvin Smith. Uh, I'm a professor here in the Department of Organizational Behavior uh, at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University and also a faculty director of executive education. Um, I will introduce uh, uh, your speaker for the day in this thought leader series, uh, Aaron Rocchio. Uh, I am pleased to introduce Aaron. Uh, Aaron is uh, a graduate of the Masters of Positive Organization Development and Change program. Uh, and I had the pleasure of having Aaron as a student when she was in the program. Uh, and it's been just a thrill and a joy to see all the things she has gone on to do uh, since leaving the program. Erin, uh, I won't go through her entire bio because I want to save as much time as possible for her uh, to spend sharing with you. Uh, but again, Erin is a graduate of our program here at Case, uh, but she also has an undergraduate degree uh, from Northwestern uh, in education and social policy. Uh, and while a student uh, at Northwestern, she wasn't just a student, she was a, an elite student athlete <clears throat> competing on Northwestern's women's softball team. Uh, and as part of uh, her experience in Northwestern, uh, she helped take uh, that team to kind of national national level of prominence. So um, uh, she uh, has, has done a lot in her academic as well as uh, post-academic uh, career. Erin uh, uh, is a uh, partner and principal at Evolution, uh, where her firm focuses on uh, kind of coaching, consulting, uh, and really kind of working with kind of startup and high growth companies uh, to really drive long-term holistic success. Uh, and that's important because that's in the, definitely in the vein of what she'll be talking with us about today, which is again, this notion of going from burnout to flourishing and cultivating wholeness uh, at work. Uh, Aaron's clients uh, are many. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but she's worked with organizations such as Uber, Chevron, Deloitte, uh, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, Seattle Children's Hospital, Yahoo, uh, but even as far ranging as kind of the Girl Scouts uh, of, of San Diego. Uh, so quite experienced in the work that she does. Um, she, um, uh, in her free time and personal time, uh, enjoys spending time with her two young daughters and her family. Uh, and she also has a passion uh, for being an advocate for the development of young women uh, kind of serving as leaders in their communities. Uh, there's much, much more I could say about Erin. Uh, I won't say any more at this point, though, but I just want to turn it over to her uh, and allow her to share with us uh, in this thought leadership series uh, and, and to glean uh, kind of knowledge uh, and insight from her remarks. So at this point, Erin, the floor is yours. And thank you and welcome. Thank you, Melvin. I just have to say I am tickled with joy to be here. Um, MPOD was one of the most important and joyful and transformative experiences of my life and career. And I'll talk about why in just a second. But just to be part of this community means the world to me. So thank you for inviting me here today. I love seeing familiar faces. I love seeing all the new faces. Um, we have a lot to pack into this hour, but I want to make it uh, as interactive and valuable to all of you. So Right off the bat, I would invite you to drop any questions that might come up in the chat. I'll answer what I can, and then I'll give you my contact information. We can follow up um, if we don't cover everything today. So as Melvin said, I'm a graduate of the MPOD 7 uh, cohort, and which um, was 10 years ago. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, and uh, since then, I have uh, a couple of things uh, cooking. One is that I have a very strong partnership with a company out of LA, as Melvin said, called Evolution. Um, I'm a senior partner there. That's where all of my coaching and consulting work really takes place these days. We work with some really impressive companies. Um, and of course, everything that I learned in MPOD is, uh, comes to bear in all that work, which I'll explain. I also have had over the last six or so years, a passion around really diving into the science behind workplace burnout and understanding because I have experienced it personally, 
um, many different times in different uh, iterations of my life as an athlete, now as a mom, but certainly professionally. So I was really committed to figuring out what was going on and what were the kind of deep and meaningful solutions that I didn't hear people talking about. So that's the genesis of wholeness at work. And I'll explain uh, my thinking on it, some of the theory that informs my work today, a lot of which you might recognize coming from um, MPOD, and then some new research that I've added and um, I'm happy to share. So enough about me. Let me, here we go. Um, these are some of the clients that we tend to work with. So a lot of what I'm going to share with you today comes not only from academ academics and kind of science-based uh, research, but also from my experience working with client systems. And um, what you see on the screen here are the three products that I've put together to support my coaching work around burnout and wholeness. And I use these with individuals. I use these with teams a lot. Um, and then uh, with organizations at scale and leader development programs. And I can explain what they are later. Um, but if you want to nerd out like me on this topic, we can certainly do that. And you can see a lot of my uh, thought work around uh, whole, at our wholeness at work.com. I wanted to start today with um, a quote that I think sums up my philosophy around sustainable leading. I have often felt the tension between wanting to do good in the world and create change and be a catalyst for change, and then experiencing the toll that that takes on us personally, and how it feels like almost um, the way our systems and culture are set up today, and a lot of our businesses are set up, is that you can't do good and also thrive in your personal life at the same time. It felt like one or the other, and I am very committed to solving that problem. I don't think we should have to make that choice. Um, I also have a, an irritation around this idea of work-life balance because I think it sets us up to fail. I think at any given moment, we bring all parts of ourselves into our work, into whatever space that we're in. And the work really is about kind of learning to pay attention and meet our needs moment to moment in all realms of well-being. And this is a lifelong journey. So this isn't just how do I achieve peak performance, you know, for a short period of time. This is really um, taking a look long term to say how how can I flourish and thrive over the course of my career and over the course of my lifetime. Um, so that's a little bit about kind of some of the foundational orientation that I'm coming from. So as I've hinted at already. A lot of what you're about to see is rooted in some of the foundations that some of you might recognize if you're a graduate already of the MPOD program or if you're considering MPOD, but there really truly are three huge ideas that have changed my life. Um, and you'll see them embedded. The Intentional Change Theory, Positive Coaching. Melvin, congrats on your new book. I recommend it to everybody. <laughs> um, Intentional change theory informs absolutely every single client interaction that I have, and it works. It's very effective, um, and it's clear. So that's rooted in here in this foundation. Um, the other thing, uh, Richard Boyatz's work around resonance and renewal shows up here. I'll talk about that in a second. I found that really compelling to understand the, the link between our own mental, physical, spiritual health, and our ability to show up with emotional intelligence. And everything that we continue to discover in um, neuroscience just reinforces these ideas. And so I found that incredibly important. And then, of course, appreciative inquiry. You know, I've been doing appreciative inquiry type work now since I graduated 10 years ago in small pockets um, to large scale summits. And all of that is a part of this idea of sustainable, healthy, leaders and sustainable culture. So those are three big ideas. There are people here in this room today that I hold very dear, um, absolutely incredible human beings that I've met and continue to be in touch with through this program. And then the last thing I'll just say, and then I'll dive into wholeness at work a bit, is um, I think one of the most, uh, this may sound obvious to other people, but one of the most surprising to me outcomes is the um, sense of confidence that I got that almost, I feel like no one will ever be able to take away from me because of the depth of competence 
that I received in my MPOD program. Um, and it's very clear. I'm like, whatever the problem is, we can figure it out because I know I've got this strong foundation. And so I just think that's so invaluable and um, can't say enough about the value and importance of this work. Um, and I've sent many people to MPOT as well, and I hope to continue doing so. Um, so with that, and yes, I see a question. I absolutely have a book list uh, and we'll speak to that as well. So finding wholeness at work. I'm going to spare you because of our time today. I'm going to spare you my long journey um, personally, but I'll share with you some of the research and um, tools and frameworks that I have come to develop around this idea of wholeness. And you'll notice that I'm using that word specifically or intentionally. Wholeness and well-being are related, but they're not the same thing. And so I'm going to talk about well-being, but wholeness to me is broader. Um, well-being is a little tricky because it kind of conveys a binary of like, I'm either well or I'm not well. And in the course of our life, we are both, right? And I want to know how do we hold and welcome all of it and still thrive and flourish in our work. So the first thing I want to do is distinguish stress versus burnout. Um, many people, when they come to me, talk about, you know, temporary stress or God, I'm having a real crunch time. What do I do? And, you know, there's a ton of um, data that says for short term, stress is important uh, to enhancing our performance, actually. If you have the right uh, mental model around it, stress in the moment can help you survive. It can help you do great things, but there has to be relief on the other side, as we know. Um, but most of us are not living in short-term stress. Most of us are living in long-term stress, especially with the state of the world, right? It feels like the macro environment right now is increasingly chaotic and uncertain. And um, this is kind of the the norm, if you will, right? We're living in a long-term state of stress, many of us. Burnout is distinct. There are three specific symptoms at the individual level that I'll talk about today. Um, it's really important that we don't use those terms loosely, that we be a little disciplined because there are really important and clear solutions for workplace burnout um, that are distinct from self-care, stress management, that sort of thing. So, and as you see, if you are familiar with resident leadership, um, ahem, <laughs> um, uh, Boyatzis calls this chronic power stress. And so I found there's different populations of clients that I work with, some of whom are at the leadership level where chronic power stress is a very apt description for the burnout that they experience when they're in the, they're responsible and caring for lots of human beings or lots of system, big systems. There's also burnout that happens, obviously, when you don't hold that level of leadership or responsibility, um, and this is still very applicable. Burnout specifically is defined by Christine Maslach as um, lost energy, lost enthusiasm, and lost confidence. Uh, chronic stress over time has significant impact, as we know, on our physical well-being, on our mental health, and actually contributes to the downward spiral of performance. Um, what that can look like in terms of symptoms, I like to think about it in, uh, in this way. So the first is emotional exhaustion. It's not just that I'm tired, it's that I'm also emotionally depleted. It's like, you know, you've heard the phrase, I'm tired of being tired. Like I'm just, I just can't anymore. <laughs> I'm so physically depleted, my emotional capacity is nil. Okay, this is where we see that gap or that connection point to EQ as well. I just can't even show up mindfully or thoughtfully because I'm so depleted. The other symptom, symptom two, is that we start to become cynical in that we might think it's always going to be this way. I have no power to change the conditions that are causing me chronic stress or burnout. We might predict the worst. And then what we start to do if we're in severe burnout is we start to withdraw from relationships and the types of activities that would renew us. Okay, we, we start to kind of pull away, especially at work. And then that happens. And now we start to see reduced efficacy. Our performance is now impacted. 
and it feeds on itself as a negative spiral. And so the other interesting thing when I work with uh, client groups is they'll say, wow, I never realized that my self-doubt or my imposter syndrome could have been connected to my level of burnout. And it absolutely is. It's a great place of inquiry, great um, place to, to look. Okay, so there's three clear burnout symptoms at the individual level. Um, and so I wanted to kind of mark them here. The other question that plagued me uh, as I was practicing and working and this topic kept coming up for myself and for so many, the very best research that I could find out there really pointed to engagement as like the creme de la creme. Like if you have engaged an engaged workforce or you're feeling engaged at work, you've made it. <laughs> and yes, engagement's wonderful. We want to have it. We want to feel it. But for me, it was not sufficient. So as you all know, engagement is defined by having um, energy, right? An excess of energy, discretionary effort that I can then give back to my workplace. I'm involved, I wanna say yes, and I'm effective. So quite distinct from the three symptoms of burnout I just described. But again, on my quest for wholeness, I said there's gotta be a positive future that we can live into that's actually gonna move me beyond engagement something that's more sustainable and long-term. And so for me, um, I define wholeness in this way. Wholeness means not only do I have energy moment to moment, but I'm actively practicing renewal. I'm actively taking care of my needs moment to moment, day to day. And, and at, listen, I'm a single working mom. I know how difficult this is. This is like five minutes at a time. And I'll talk about some practices that we can all, um, I want to leave you with before we're done here. But renewal does not have to be big, expensive, time consuming. It is really moment to moment, <clears throat> which requires that we pay attention to ourselves and have a level of self-awareness moment to moment. The second aspect of wholeness is flourishing. So when we get overly focused on one domain of our life, like work, um, like me, right? <laughs> fellow workaholic, um, we absolutely are more prone to the left side of the spectrum. So I am interested in how we create flourishing in all of the domains of our life that are important to us. What does that look like? That We each have our own answer for that. Um, so that's like a constant uh, quest, if you will. It's never a place we've achieved or we're never, it's not static, but we're moving towards flourishing. And then the third piece of wholeness to me is that we're always on the quest for learning and self-mastery. So you'll also see this in some of the um, language of our MPOD folks is to have this orientation towards growth and learning and to, to discovery. And for me, that's critical to be able to move into a space of wholeness in different domains of our life. Okay. So the place that I might invite us now just to engage so I'm not talking at you for an hour, is if you will, put in chat where you find yourself on this burnout to wholeness spectrum today, just so I can get a pulse. Like, are we in full-blown burnout? Are we really aware and um, clear about wholeness? Are we somewhere in between engagement? Okay, cool. Great. I'm seeing a ton of variety here. This is very normal and good to see. Often when I work with groups, I see very few people even naming wholeness as their current state. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, somewhere between. There's a lot of in-betweens. Between burnout, some people, yeah, recovering from burnout, moving into engagement, some solidly in engagement somewhere between engagement and wholeness, okay, in between. Thank you. Okay, so um, just make note of that. And as we go through today, I'll talk about how you might be able to move yourself from left to right. And no, I want to say too, this is not linear. One of the other key points is that for me, I found burnout is cyclical. So there are patterns of um, behavior and patterns of thinking and beliefs at the individual and collective that have a cycle through burnout throughout our life and career. So 
Um, notice where you are now and, and know it doesn't just like, okay, I've solved burnout. I'm good. It's over. <laughs> there are things we always have to be aware of, myself included, so that we um, recognize the signs and we tend to our needs before we go off the burnout cliff, if you will. Okay, great. So another important framework, um, this comes out of integral theory, which I don't believe we actually dove into it in depth at MPOD, but something that I've done extensively since in my own um, work. Uh, so integral theory, essentially one of the models in integral theory, and I'm gonna spare you because it's very heady, um, but it looks at everything at three levels and says that at any given moment, there's a reality occurring at the individual level, at the interpersonal or cultural level, and at the systems and structures level. Um, at evolution, we call that I, we, it. Uh, if you're a, an integral nerd, it, it's actually four quadrants. We've condensed it and its into this third. But I find this really important in the topic of burnout and wholeness because burnout is often described today in the literature as occurring primarily, until recently, primarily at the I level. Like you've failed as an individual because you're not resilient enough. So we do a ton of programs on resilience, but yet it's not the individual who's causing a lot of problems, right? They're at the effect of a broken system, let's say, or a toxic workplace culture. And so in my practice, what I've come to do is evaluate burnout to wholeness at all of these dimensions. And that gives us a more accurate map of where we can create change. So sneak peek to the end, if I could have it all my way, wholeness would look like we would all have strength and practice and structures for self-renewal. So we're supporting ourselves at the individual level. We would have culture both in the workplace and outside of the workplace where we had communities that nurtured us, communities of care, where we could bring our whole self and feel seen and heard and acknowledged. Um, and then we also had systems that were rehumanized. Most of our workplace systems and structures today are built for robots. And unfortunately, it feels like it's only getting worse. <laughs> um, and we can save a conversation around AI, uh, artificial intelligence AI for another day, because I'm not prepared to talk about that yet. But the at the it level, ideally, we, especially if you're in a position of power, to find all the different places you can to rehumanize and redesign systems to better support human needs, because they're not set up for human needs right now. So this is the ultimate, that's the end game that I would love. That's that's my vision for wholeness at work. Okay, so another exercise here coming in uh, here that I'd like to offer. So the woman that I mentioned earlier on, Christine Maslock, is kind of the pre preeminent researcher on workplace burnout along with some of her colleagues. And they have a really fantastic tool called the Maslock Burnout Inventory and Areas of Workplace Survey. And essentially they point to six evidence-based domains that directly impact an individual's experience of burnout. So, and these are the six, and I'm gonna define them for you. And then I'd love for you to just maybe do a quick evaluation, like which of these feel strong, which of these might be an opportunity. Most of us, when we think about the contributors to burnout, we think about workload. I have too much to do, I don't have enough time. Um, for Maslock, workload here is not just about a kind of a large quantity of work, but it's saying that the amount of work that you're responsible for is inhuman to accomplish. So it's going beyond human limits. Um, it's not just like, oh, I have this intense project and I have to stretch for a short period of time and I can come back to some level of norm. It is like I'm always doing 25 jobs. Right. And how many of us have left a job and then they had to hire like four more people to do it instead of you? Right. That's how you know, okay, workload was was a problem. Now, interestingly, some of these other domains um, I'm finding are much more, yes. And I used SCARF model all the time, by the way. I love it. Um, yes, they map beautifully. So the other domain that's been very sneaky, there's a couple of here you can see have definitely been impacted by COVID, but the next one is control. 
So a lot of people are prone to workplace burnout because they don't have the opportunity or privilege to make decisions that control their destiny and or fulfill their job responsibilities. So if I know that I've got a huge amount of work to do and I can't impact the things that I think I need to be effective at that job, I'm, that lack of control is likely to send me into burnout. The third is reward. We need to have sufficient financial and social recognition for the contributions we make to our work, okay? Especially if we tend to be over givers. Um, I've talked a little bit about community, but I wanna say again, this can be something that organizations intentionally build. And of course, I'm seeing a lot of progressive organizations today be very mindful about building community and belonging. Community here says there's a social environment and culture that's supportive and positive. If we don't have a supportive, positive work environment where people feel like they belong to a community of trusting colleagues, burnout's gonna be at play. Fairness is inequity in the system. It's a lack of transparency around who gets access to power and reward. And it also is when folks feel confused about values. So we say this, but you're asking me to do this other thing. Um, there's some uh, talk in the burnout world around moral, moral injury, where I'm being asked to do something that goes against my values. That describes the last domain here. So the difference between my personal values, things that I hold meaning around, um, if my workplace is asking me to do things that are counter to something that feels integrous to me or important to me, strong driver of workplace burnout. That's unsustainable. So I, when a lot, I coach a lot of leaders where they say, yeah, well, my values don't really fit this company anymore. We've changed, yada, yada. Like, that's fine. I'm not suggesting you leave tomorrow, but that's not a sustainable environment for someone who's looking to experience wholeness. Okay. So quickly would love to just see maybe in chat, would love to see one word uh, where you say, gosh, this is going great for me and my role or my work experience. And this one feels like a gap. And while you're doing that, I'm going to answer a question in chat. Connection between remote work patterns. Yes. Remote work has really impacted community in a significant way. It's impacted how people feel rewarded. Um, I think in many ways, remote work has in improved fairness and equity, especially for caregivers. So I've done a lot uh, with moms, with um, different underrepresented groups. I think remote work is actually better on the fairness and values front for many, but we have to be super intentional around how we build community and how we're managing workload when we can't see people. And also control, like we need to um, be extra conscious that we're transparent with decision-making, um, giving people autonomy where we can. Okay, reward and control gaps. Let me just see here, gap around values. Yeah, yep. Yeah, if values are at odds, you're certainly not gonna wanna be inclined to build community there, right? Um, yeah, workload, gap and reward. Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, again, I love the variety and uh, diversity and responses here. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, so I, this is a place for you to look. Um, all of this research is available online. Um, Christine Maslock's survey is available at MindGarden, I believe. That's where I send a lot of clients and it's wonderful. So really encourage you to, to use it. Okay, so I know well-being and wholeness, I said at the outset, are not the same thing, but I also want to, yes, I will share the link, absolutely. Um, I also want to paint a picture for a broader view of what well-being can look like in the workplace. This model comes from a partner of mine in London. It is much more comprehensive than anything I've seen in the United States, which is why I continue to use it. In fact, she just got acquired by um, the world's largest insurance brand. 
uh, because her work was so cutting edge and now she measures companies all around the world using this. So it's, I'm really proud of her. Um, so you'll notice again, some overlap with some of the AWS um, burnout domains around like what's gonna send you into burnout. But also we wanna think about actively building sufficiency in these domains of well-being. So in the States, usually we think of well-being as two of these categories, physical health. And if we're really, you know, on it, mental and emotional health, maybe. I want to explain some of the others because they are really important as well when we think about moving into wholeness. Okay. So let me start with physical health. Physical health does not, and we really could spend a whole nother three hours talking about, um, societal expectations for the way our bodies look and move. I want to be really conscious of the fact that physical health to me and it, this uh, conversation is not about any shoulds. This is about, do you trust the effective functioning of your body? Is it working well for you? Okay. Do you have a positive relationship with your physical health? That's it. Okay. I'll talk a lot about that later on. Um, competency in action says, I know what's important in whatever I'm doing. And I feel competent in my ability to move in that direction. So I feel like I can take the steps needed to support my well-being or my performance. Um, meaning and purpose is really at the core of this. And a lot of the burnout research is supporting how critical purpose is. The more we're connected to our why in the work that we do, uh, the better, we're, better off we're going to be in general. But it's almost a... Uh, a resilience factor against burnout. I will say with purpose and meaning, you have to be careful because if you feel too much purpose in your work, you can be um, vulnerable to overworking where your identity and your, like your value as a human being and your work output get merged into one. That's also going to put you at risk. So meaning and purpose I hold with a little bit of a caveat. Financial health, do you have sufficient resources? where you're not stressed day to day about your next meal, having a roof over your head. That's critical to well-being in our society. Networks and community. Do you have relationship with the broader community around you and the people that hold influence and power? For example, do you, how many business owners do you know in your community? If you needed to go get XYZ resource, who would you go to? Do you have your people that you can, can access. So networks and community is big. And then lastly here is relationship. This is our intimate familial relationship. <laughs> so people in our close circle, are those positive and supportive or are those draining and or harmful? Certainly we have to tend to the well-being of those relationships if we're gonna be well and whole um, overall, excuse me. So the way that I use this, and you're always welcome to do this now, is to simply look at, uh, like grade yourself one to 10. 10 being, I feel very full and sufficient in that domain. One, haven't even thought about it. It's completely missing, right? <clears throat> and not everything needs to be a 10 for you to be whole and well. Oh, thank you. A mental and emotional health. I didn't talk about that. Thank you. Mental and emotional health is super important here to well-being because it's not um, saying that you feel sane and stable at all times. It's recognizing that human beings have a variety of emotional experiences and really that you have resources when you're not feel, feeling well emotionally or mentally, you have places to go and people to call to support you in that recovery. Okay. <laughs> it's allowing for the full range of, of uh, human experience, but it's about, you can see, feeling connected and supported when you need resources. Okay. Again, this is not anyone else. Um, it's not for anyone else to judge your level of well-being. This is for you to self-assess. Now, the way she uses this is she'll bring this in and people will self-assess across a whole business. And then you can, you know, design organizational interventions, maybe. Um, I really only use this with one-on-one -on -one coaching clients right now. 
Okay, so you can do a well being check for time. I'm going to keep us moving because I want to talk about the future. I want to talk about wholeness and the roadmap to wholeness. Um, so these seven steps match beautifully, you'll notice, to the internet uh, intentional change theory and really came about from a series of questions that I asked myself when I was in my own valley of despair, if you will. I often say like, never waste a good existential crisis because this is the result of my existential crisis. <laughs> and I know other people who have gone on to live very beautiful creative lives uh, as a result of those valleys of despair. So if you're in engagement and you wanna move to wholeness or you're in burnout and you go, God, where I need a roadmap for where I might wanna go. First and foremost, and I'm gonna do these quickly, uh, you all, since we're in a big group and we're trying to get a lot in today. All of this, by the way, is outlined in depth, in depth, in depth. And you can really take your time in uh, my coaching book here, Wholeness at Work. Okay. It's chock full of all of this. And so this is not designed to go quick for us to go quickly through, but I'm just sharing the uh, overall roadmap with you. Excuse me. First and foremost, we have to understand what we deeply want and care about. So step one is all about personal values and vision, okay? And I know I'm preaching to the choir here about, about that. Most people, it's surprising to me, actually, because I care so deeply about values and vision, how many people I work with, when I say, what do you really want? They're like, I have no idea. I could spend six months coaching someone on that, that one step, that one question. It's really important um, and powerful. Step two says, I've got to get honest and real with myself. And this is where we might in, you know, introduce feedback. We might say, let me do some kind of really deep self-inquiry. What's the gap between my current state and what I really want? Step three here is learning how to clear your mechanism. If anybody else is a Bull Durham fan, we've got to clear the mechanism of noise and get really, really clear on what our focus is given our vision. So often this is where we might do some work um, early on when I mentioned IWEA, we might do some it level work around like, what are the priorities of my business? What are the priorities of my team? What are all the things that are nagging at me all day long that I probably need to delegate, create different structures around so they're getting handled, but it's not constantly clogging up my mental system. Step four is about building a team around you. Um, I've spent a lot of years in the personal development realm understanding how to build and operate in collaborative teams. I do absolutely everything in a team. Now, um, I do a lot on my own as well, but when you're trying to think about flourishing over time, given all the things we've talked about already, having an aligned team, both in the workplace and outside of the workplace is critical. So figure out who your team is, right? Besides the obvious ones. Five is, this is a lifelong commitment to practice. What are the practices that are gonna support me in all the domains of my life? I'll talk about that in a second. I call them wholeness practices. And then what are the mechanisms ongoingly for support and accountability? And then lastly, for those that are really committed to this, it is how do I continue to create healthy, flourishing workplace culture wherever I'm in? No matter what space I'm in, I'm creating and embodying healthy culture. Okay, so this is a lot to pack into a single slide, but there, um, this is the ideal for me around how we do this. Um, in resident leadership, you will find some really beautiful stuff about what renewal looks like and means. And so you'll see that reflected here. And then I shared <clears throat> how I've built on that is that, and what I've shared earlier, and somebody put this in the chat, um, vacation is insufficient for renewal at the level we're talking about. Okay. I love vacation. I love massage. Self-care in and of itself, whatever you define that to be is insufficient when we're talking about burnout or we're talking about wanting to get into a space of wholeness um, in all dimensions. And it needs to include all of you. So that's why when I think about wholeness, it's really the work is integrating all aspects of ourselves that need tending. 
like a, like a garden or a child. Okay. We're so good at caring for these other things and often neglect our own needs in all these dimensions. So we know mindfulness works. We know compassion works. And we know that there are some critical components of physical self-care. So here are some things. And I filled this out more deeply just so you can get a sense. A lot of people are like, oh, I hate meditating. I can't sit still. That's fine. There's lots of ways to practice mindfulness, even while you're doing your dishes, right? Um, basic breath work, um, journaling. I've done a lot of work since MPOD around um, understanding self-compassion. There's a beautiful body of work by Dr. Kristen Neff at selfcompassion.org. I've done her trainings. It's phenomenal and is probably one of the most important things on this list I found to create a sense of wholeness over time is healing and um, nourishing that relationship to self. And then of course, there are basics that we need to keep our physical vehicle strong, right? And, and functioning. And so some of these you're like, of course, Aaron, those are obvious, but many of us neglect them for many good reasons. And all I will say is if you treat your body with a little bit of the self-compassion I just talked about, such that you're feeding it well, you're moving it, you're resting it when it needs rest, you're loving on it when it needs love, you're making sure you're taking care of yourself with physicians appropriately, like we all have individual needs around this, um, but prioritize that. That's going to be a critical practice, again, over the course of your life. So I'd love to see if there is, um, and again, I, with large groups like this, chat's fabulous. If you can just drop in one thing that you go, oh, hadn't considered that. That's something, a practice I might want to take on to support my own wholeness. What's something from here that you go, oh, I'd like to do that maybe going forward or even in the next week? Yes, hydration, joy. Love that sleep. Spiritual practice is fabulous. You'll notice too that um, every day your needs around what wholeness practice practices you might need will change. And so it's helpful to have a host of tools in your just uh, toolkit or your practice kit that you can pull on when needed. Nature, yoga, yes open possibility outside. Just got a puppy and my 10 minute walks with him a few times a day are like my new joy bomb for the day. Get to be outside. I get fresh air and sunshine on my face and I can come back renewed and it's simple and quick, right? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So wholeness, this is kind of like I'm wrapping up us up here. Uh, a bit. Wholeness really exists, not as something way out there, but exists in the moment to moment choices that we make to renew ourselves, to pause, to self-nurture, to learn. And it's not a nice to have, especially when we hold power and privilege. We have to be very conscious of how we are influencing those around us. Um, the systems and structures we're setting up the cultural norms that we're role modeling. Okay. So this is vital, vital work as practitioners and as human beings. Um, again, here's what sustained well being looks like humanized systems, communities of care, and self renewal at all three dimensions. So a lot of people say, well, that's all wonderful and sounds very theoretical and, you know, great concepts. Sure. Okay. What do I do tomorrow? <laughs> so for my practically minded folks, um, here's some quick applications that um, I wanted to offer. So as I said, you go first and you, of course, you hear this uh, all the time, right? Airplane metaphor, put your oxygen mask on first. Um, for those of us, especially with, with uh, leadership or caregiving responsibilities, people are watching what we do. And I can't tell you how many folks will say, 
Oh yeah. I give my, I, my team has such great work-life balance. We have unlimited PTO. And then their team will come to me and say, this place is awful because my boss is emailing me his whole vacation or her whole vacation. And so I really don't care what policies you have set up. I mean, I do care, but if your behavior is not role modeling sustainability, it's all for not. So be mindful of that. Okay. When you are in a leadership role, ask your team for what their immediate job stressors are and do what you can to solve them. <laughs> it's just simple. Like they're very clear, low hanging fruit items that I bet you people in your world will go, oh, if you just fix this, this would be great. Um, not everything is that simple, but there are things that we can do. I teach workshops on this, uh, priority setting and boundaries. How do we make sure our yeses are yes and our noes are no? And how do we know the difference somatically in our bodies? How do we reflect them with how we spend our time and how we're working? Um, where possible, give away control and autonomy. Give it away. We're working from a power with model here, not power over. The more power I can give away to help you do your job well, and relinquish control. Now, not over everything, of course. Be appropriate and mindful, but where possible, especially around how people are spending their time. This is critical. Um, having healthy, effective meetings. It sounds so basic, but you'd be amazed at how many people don't do that well, right? And your calendar, I, I encourage folks to always be um, kind of doing a bit of a calendar hygiene. Is this reflecting my priorities? Is this reflecting space? for me and my renewal practices? Is, this, is my calendar a reflection of my values? Okay, if not, great. That's, we're constantly looking at that. There's no judgment. It's just a place to look. Build community support and connections. In the pandemic, especially, and this is a, a nod to remote work, it is vital that we create space for genuine conversation about pe how people are actually doing. Okay, and making it safe for them to, to really share their response. Um, how are you really doing? What support can I offer you? What do you need? How can I help you get that? Okay, lastly, learning and development. I know, again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but is vital for our brains to get out of burnout and survival and into a space of hope and possibility. Um, one of the things I discovered in the pandemic was how many times People would say, oh, I just needed my brain to have a break from thinking about all the crap so I could come and like be renewed intellectually. Okay. So um, the more we can provide that to people around us, the better. So as I said, all of this and more is reflected in the um, product in the center, wholeness at work. That's what all of this is rooted in. It's designed as a self-guided coaching program. It's also really great to have as a tool for coaches if you're working with a client who's in burnout. Everything you will need is there. Um, I will include after this some additional links, including the burnout survey that I recommend, including some books. There's also a whole host of books inside the back of Wholeness at Work that I recommend around a ton of topics. And yes, many MPOD professors are listed there. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. I just, I really do love MPOT. I'm not making that up. Um, for those of you who are like, oh, I want to get my feet wet and learn a little bit more. I created this uh, brief primer, welcome to wholeness at work. And then my most favorite product is the, um, and I love all my product babies, but my most favorite one is the new one. It's a card deck and it has practices for renewal specific to your Enneagram type. So for those of you that are Enneagram nerds like me, this is really fun. There's 108 mindfulness uh, practices or wholeness practices, quite honestly, that hit all the dimensions that we talked about. And um, there's 12 by Enneagram type, but they all are great. If you do they're you know, all the tools are useful and valuable. So, and uh, you can take them wherever you go. Another great tool, I use these with teams a lot. So teams that are struggling with burnout, there's a ton of good stuff that you can use there. So I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Um, you can also email me. I know it's confusing. I have two emails, but start with the first one. It's the easiest one. But the other one's also available. 
All of my work, as I said, is on um, ourwholenessatwork.com. And then you can see what my team and I are up to around this topic. And then more broadly, like all of our OD and coaching work is at evolution.team. Um, thank you, Laura. So proud to know you. Um, I just love you guys so much. Card decks. Yes. So I'm going to be quiet now for a second. And I'd love to see if anybody has any questions. Slide eight. Yes, I certainly can. Yes. Great. So here are the distinctions between stress and burnout. There's a fabulous TED talk, by the way, on the benefit of stress. Um, and I forget her name. I do actually include it in the workbook. I have to find it. It's been a minute since I watched it, but um, a really important distinction to make between stress and burnout. Yeah, the Enneagram test that I, so I'll say briefly, I do a ton on the Enneagram. I actually have a free Enneagram community office hours event tomorrow. And I do them every month. So if you're curious about the Enneagram, go to my website. There's a whole host of Enneagram stuff there. Um, the test that I use is the Ready, R-H-E-T-I with Enneagram Institute. Um, it's not perfect. It's statistically valid. I often have to do some coaching around it for folks that are tied. So I don't think any survey is perfect. I think the best way to type yourself in the Enneagram is through self-inquiry and working with a, a skilled, competent Enneagram coach, not someone who just read a book, please, because there's a lot of people out there doing that. Um, yes, Kelly McGonigal, thank you so much. Brilliant. Coaching and therapy. Yes. Um, when do I refer a client to therapy for burnout? I refer a client to therapy when I see um, things that certainly fall outside the realm of coaching. So if, if I'm just assessing for burnout and working on how that's showing up in the workplace, I will do that. But I often and almost exclusively, if someone's in extreme burnout, I make sure I'm working in parallel with a therapist because often there's other symptoms of depression, anxiety, a whole host of other mental health factors that have to be addressed that we are not licensed to deal with. Um, so Almost every coaching client I work with, it's in any kind of extreme pain like that. That's those tracks are working in tandem. It's just really important to me. I don't want to take that on. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. We have maybe one or two more minutes. Um, Pat, I think you're muted. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here and your awesome engagement and questions. So, Erin, as we're coming close to the one o'clock hour, I just want to, um, out of respect for everybody's time, give a few comments here. Uh, first of all, um, I want everyone to know that this record, this has all been recorded, and I will be sending the link to everybody. And uh, so please, for your viewing pleasure, but also to share with others. Um, I also would encourage you to contact Erin with any other questions you might have, and then watch for our new monthly newsletter, The Thought Leader Insights, where we will continue this conversation with Erin and also include some commentary from Melvin Smith, um, who graciously agreed to be with us today. Thank you, Melvin. I just want to thank you, Erin, for uh, presenting today another inspiring talk for the Thought Leader Series. And I want to thank all of you for joining us and invite you back on May 10th when MPOD faculty Ron Fry and a brand new graduate from our program, Dr. Matthew Barber, will present Appreciative Inquiry in the VUCA, Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous, world of healthcare. So thank you everyone. And um, Aaron, if you have any other comments to make, you're free to do so.
Thank you again. This is such a joy. I really could spend all day with you all um, talking about these topics. I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. If we're not, um, would love to stay in touch and learn about what you guys are finding and discovering. Um, and I see there's some questions I don't have time to answer right now. So I will follow up um, and go MPOD.